excited to have with us today a representative from UNCW, Summer Lewis. And Summer Lewis is going to talk with us um, not just about classroom management, but how to engage your students and how that impacts the classroom environment and therefore your management system. So let's welcome Summer Lewis. I am not going to use that. Good morning. <laughs> How's everybody doing this morning? Good. Good. Are you enjoying your BT orientation? Oh, yeah. This is day two. Yeah. Still excited? Yeah. Still here? Yeah. Haven't run away screaming yet? Yeah. Okay, good. All right. Well, um, as Marcia said, my name is Summer Lewis, and I'm the director of our professional development system in the Watson College of Education here at UNCW. How many UNCW graduates? Yay! Okay, all right, good. Um, Woohoo! All right, and welcome to everybody else, too. We're not going to discriminate. Um, I am here today to talk to you about classroom management, getting your students engaged, fun, exciting stuff. We're going to work together in small groups. You're going to be up, you're going to be moving around. It's going to be fantastic. Um, but before I do that, I just want to kind of preface that with, I oversee our professional development system, and you are a part of that. You are employed here now in New Hanover County. UNCW is located right here in New Hanover County. And you, just by nature of joining your school, are now a part of our professional development system. And because of that, or due to that fact, we provide all different types of support to beginning teachers, to veteran teachers, to teachers uh, seeking national board certification. And so even if you are not a UNCW graduate, know that when I talk about resources and different things today, that all of this support is available to you. We welcome you with open arms to New Hanover County, and we welcome you into our partnership. So so at the end today, in the last like two minutes, I'll talk to you just a little bit about the support that we provide because one of my hats that I wear um, is overseeing our first years of teaching support program. And I work actually very closely with Marsha and her team um, with regards to beginning teacher support. So I will give you a little bit of information about that, but not until a little later. Everybody has a handout in front of them, a little stapled packet. Is there anybody that we missed? Does everybody have one? And I'll go ahead and tell you that I asked our graduate assistants to uh, make copies for everybody. And when I handed them this packet, it was completely out of order. So we are not going to go in the order that this packet is stapled in. And I apologize for that. I realized that as I was driving here today. Today we're going to talk a little bit about classroom management. What is it? You know, what background are you bringing with regards to classroom management? Um, where are you biased in terms of how a classroom should be managed? We're going to talk a little about why students are disruptive in your classroom. We're going to look at the research slightly. Um, but I really want to get some of your feedback with regards to why you think students are being disruptive. We're also going to take one of those, remember those like self magazines and Cosmo where you'd get really excited, boys and girls, and you would take the quizzes and it's like, who's your celebrity crush? We're going to kind of do one of those sort of quizzes today to talk about your classroom management style. And then I'm going to share with you five R's for better classroom management. So as we're getting started, I want you to be thinking in the background, somewhere in your mind, just a little bit about you know, who is a student that maybe you've struggled with in the past? Um, what kind of behaviors do you feel like you struggle with in your classroom? Because I really, as we're, as we're going through this today for the next hour and change, um, I want you to be thinking about how to make this relevant to you and your situation and your classroom, okay? So be thinking about that as we go through today. First thing I would like you to do on page three, if you'll go ahead and open up and find the page that says getting your students engaged, five easy steps. And it's got a big blank space at the top. I'd like you to go ahead and take a minute and give me your best definition of classroom management. Do it on your own. You can give me a sentence. You can make a bulleted list. Do whatever you got to do. Give me your best definition of classroom management. All right. And as you are finishing up your definition, I would like you to narrow it down to one word. That's all you get to share. Uh, one word. So looking at that definition, if you had to bring that definition down to just one word, what does classroom management mean to you? Give me one word. Go ahead and circle it, put a star around it, underline it, do whatever you have to do. We are going to whip around this room really quickly, and I'm going to ask everybody to share just their one word. That's all you get. One. Not like a special hyphenated word, just one word. Okay, so choose your word.
And it's okay to repeat as we go around. Okay, the repetition is all right. We're gonna go really quickly, so follow me. We're gonna pay attention. Start with you, one word. Respect. Respect. Control. Control. Respect. 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 Efficient. Respect. 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 Control. Control. Learning. Learning. Focus. 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 Safety. Safety. Procedures. 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 Positive. 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 Learning. Learning. Respect. 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 System. Safety. 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 Structure. Order, control, efficient, reinforcement, reinforcement, reinforcement. Did I totally skip you guys? Focus, order, safe, engaged, structure, structure, accountability, accountability, relationships, focus, consistency, leaders, positive, facilitate, environment, accountability, consistency. Procedures, productive, control. control, safe, engagement, consistency, safe, safe. Order. order. Okay, all right, good job, all right. So we kind of get a sense of what we think about classroom management based on those words. Here are just kind of some book definitions of classroom management. The process of ensuring that lessons run smoothly, prevention of disruptive behavior, the process of managing behaviors, designing an activity, monitoring it, following up, the tangible and intangible techniques that we use to engage students and keep them engaged. And then this is always my favorite, content, conduct, and covenant. I think covenant makes it sound very holy. Um, but covenant meaning creating a community, right? That community culture in your classroom. So the key here, and we heard it in, in many of your words, is that classroom management is more than just management. Right? It's more than just managing student behavior. When we talk about that term, classroom management, really what we mean is anything we could possibly do to keep our kids engaged. Right? Sure, we want them to behave, but we also want them to be interested. We want to make the content that we're delivering to them relevant. Right? So it's everything that we do to keep our students engaged. And it says it's important to remember that we need to look at our instruction first and foremost, and the ways in which we engage our students. Often it is so easy to look at our kids and think about what they need to do differently in order to you know, create your classroom management plan. When first and foremost, as teachers, we need to look at ourselves, the things that we can control. If there's anything I've learned in the last couple of years with a two-year-old child at home is that I cannot control her behavior. She wants to lay out on the floor and lose it because I forgot to bring her hat home from daycare. That's what happened yesterday. I can't control that. <laughs> I could have changed it if I had remembered that hat, but when we're on our way home, I can't control it, okay? So thinking about that management of behavior beyond just controlling behavior is gonna be key today, okay? And key to successful overall classroom management. Underneath that little blurb that you just filled out, there are a bunch of lines. I'd like you to go ahead and pay attention to the left side, the first five lines, and give me, just on your own, what are the top five reasons why you think students are being disruptive, i.e. not engaged, in your classroom? Top five things that come to your head, top five reasons why students are disruptive. Okay. You have, you may still have one blank spot or two blank spots, but on the right hand side you have five more blank spots. What I would like you to do is in a second we're gonna go ahead and stand up. I want you to move around, talk to other people who are in here. I want you to find five more different reasons from the first five original that you listed. Five more reasons that students are disruptive so that on your paper you'll have a total of 10. Any questions? Okay, get up and move around. All right, are we ready? We're good? Okay. All right. With intensity, I would like you to look at the other people at your table. If you're looking at me, you're not looking at them. Look at the other people at your table with intensity. And really quickly, I want you to do not it. Okay. The last person who you are all pointing at and laughing at <laughs> is going to be the person who shares. All you have to do is share one, one thing from your item. This is very low risk. <laughs> so one thing from your list, that person who was the last, not it. 
And Marsha's going to carry around the microphone so we catch you on video. All right, so reasons, top 10, I think we have tables, 10 reasons we think why people are being disruptive. Make sure you listen so that we don't repeat in this case. Okay, a reaction to the teacher's behavior. Okay, good, thank you. Reaction to the teacher's behavior, why that student is disruptive. Who was the not it at that table? Okay. Mm -hmm. Possibly boredom. Boredom, yeah. good, okay, good, boredom. Back table. We said that the student is not being challenged. Good, student not being challenged, nice. A desire for control of the yes. classroom. Yes, control, power, good. We said attention seeking. Sure, attention seeking behavior, okay. Lack of attention. Lack of attention from the teacher, from home, from anything? Just in general. Just in general. Enough. Okay, not getting enough attention in general. Okay, all right. From this table, who was your not it? They don't understand. Okay, they don't understand material. In terms of procedures or the material being okay. covered. Okay, great, great. They're tired. They're tired. Okay, good. <laughs> the microphone makes this so exciting. Okay. Um, we had low self-esteem, like they've okay. kind of just given up. Okay, kind of given up. Don't, nobody cares. Low self-esteem. Okay. And last table. Bad home life or social struggles. Good. Okay, so coming from home, something's going on. Um, based on an early research study, top five reasons why students are disruptive in your classroom, and we've hit on several of these. One, bored due to lack of a challenge, and you actually shared both of those. So bored due to lack of a challenge. They see your lessons as being irrelevant. See your lessons as being irrelevant. They don't feel that the teacher cares, so the teacher has not connected. Perceived, the student's perceived inability or lack of understanding and somebody hit on this earlier, their need for power or control. So top five reasons, based on a research study, why students are disruptive in your classroom. When you look at those five reasons, how many can you as the teacher affect? Yeah, all of them, okay, all of them. In some form or fashion, you can have an effect on each of these reasons. So really, at the end of the day, it's up to you, right? It's up to you to figure out how you're going to reach this student. Okay, in your packets, you have, sorry, I keep doing that because I have this microphone. All right, in your packets, you have a classroom management profile sheet. It is, I believe, the second page. This is that Cosmo quiz I was talking about earlier. There are 12 statements on this classroom management profile. For each of the statements, I want you to go ahead and write down whether you strongly disagree, disagree, whether you're neutral, agree, or strongly agree with each of those statements. Um, take them for what they are. Take them at face value. I'm not going to give you any more details about each statement. Just use it for what it is. And as you write down strongly agree, disagree, use the number. So strongly disagree is the number one. Disagree is the number two because um, you're going to be adding up some numbers for a score here in just a second. And the slide that is up here now shows you how to score the quiz. So you can take a look at that when you're ready. Okay, so when you're ready, the slide shows you how to add up your results. You'll see that each of the statements refers to a particular classroom management style. So you'll add up your score from statements one, three, and nine. That'll give you a score for the authoritarian style. Add four, eight, and 11, that's your score for authoritative. And then your higher numbers will be the style that you most likely connect with. Okay, I'm hearing lots of conversation about styles, so I'm thinking that you are done or some folks are still finishing up. 
couple of things that I will share with you. Um, one, this isn't, I'm not giving you like this scientifically based research study, like that, that's not what this is. Um, like I said, this is more similar to like the cell for the Cosmo quiz. But um, it's a good conversation starter and, and I think a good place to start with regards to thinking about your classroom management style. And I do this quite often with beginning teachers. I was actually in Duplin County at their BT orientation on Tuesday, or no, what's today, Wednesday, on Monday. <laughs> I was somewhere on Monday. Um, and you know, there were about 80 teachers there and we were talking a lot about classroom management style. They took this quiz and for some of them, they found that they were high in one or two areas that maybe they're sort of authoritative, authoritarian. They were high in both of those areas. And then I had some who I could see the fear in their eyes. They were across the board pretty even in their scores um, with regards to being also indifferent just as much as they were being authoritarian or something like that. And so let me share a little bit, of, a little bit with you about what each of these means. And let me preface that by saying that there is no right or wrong way here, okay? You all went to this quiz with, with baggage, basically, right? With, with a background in classroom management, with your previous experiences. And so each situation that you encounter often requires a different kind of style, right? You're gonna handle different students, different situations in different ways. Are you gonna be consistent? Sure. Are you gonna have your routines and procedures and things like that? Yes, and we're gonna talk about that. But um, when you're talking about individual kids and you're thinking about individual uh, situations, quite often you'll handle them in a different way. So authoritarian, what does that mean? This is the person who places more firm limits and controls on students. Classes are normally pretty calm, right? Not a lot of up and moving around, conversation. Discussion is not necessarily encouraged, and by that I don't mean it's not encouraged ever, um, but maybe discussion isn't encouraged until the teacher is finished getting through the lesson or whatever the case may be. Hold your questions until the end. Um, students follow directions and they may not question those directions. They trust you, they're following what you want them to do, and they go through follow directions from A to Z. If you scored higher on authoritative, then maybe you place limits and controls on students, but you also encourage that, um, that line of independence. So you do allow your students a little bit more freedom. You're somebody who's firm with your students, but also you have that air of politeness to you. And you discipline, but only after evaluating each situation individually. Okay, so if you are higher and authoritative. If you have more of a laissez-faire style, then you might be more of that go with the flow kind of teacher. Um, you allow your students to often do their own thing. You may be that person who has difficulty saying no, maybe in life, maybe just with your kids. Um, you also place few absolutes, few demands on your students. They absolutely have to do something. So that's just kind of your more free-flowing classroom. And then indifferent, which everybody always hates looking at this one. Indifferent, not very involved. And I don't mean not very involved by totally hands off, but not very involved in that you allow a lot of freedom with your students. You really allow them to make decisions in the class, um, to choose different directions that they might go in. You may have a group of kids working on this and this side of the room, and you know, you're know you another group working on something completely different. And you really are just kind of facilitating, um, definitely more hands off. Your expectations are low in terms of behavior. Not low expectations, meaning you don't want your students to grow, but low expectations in terms of behavior. You don't have a lot of rules and procedures that students have to follow. And so maybe overall, management is kind of lacking, okay? You've got different, thing, different students doing different things, and at times, it can seem a little chaotic and, un and unruly. And we've all had those days, trust me, okay? So those are the four different styles. At this point, we've talked or we've thought a lot about ourselves as teachers and um, our bi personal biases, our definition of classroom management, why we think students are disruptive, looked at our classroom management style. Now I want you to think about something that you are or have struggled with. Take a minute, you don't have to write it down, okay? Just I want you to be thinking about one thing that you struggle with in terms of classroom management, anything. One thing that you struggle with, a situation that you can think of that you've struggled with in the past. And if you have not been in the classroom, if you're joining us lateral entry, I don't know if we have any of you out there, if you're joining us lateral entry, it could be a life situation, right? A, a situation with your own students that, or with your own children that you have struggled with um, in terms of managing. Okay, everybody has their situation that they're thinking of? Okay, as we go through 
these next few slides, the five R's for classroom management, I want you to look at these slides through the lens of that struggle, okay? So be thinking about, if I had done this differently, this first R, maybe, um, I would have been in a better place with my student. Or if I had maybe done the second R, and you'll know what all these R's are in just a second, then maybe I would have gotten to a better place with the student. So five R's for better classroom management. The first R is relationships, okay? Relationships and rapport. I am somebody who will stand up here on a pedestal and tell you all day that your students, the importance of having relationships with your students is just beyond anything I can ever tell you. I am a New Hanover County teacher. I was a teacher at New Hanover High School before I moved on to UNCW. And at that school, with the classes that I was teaching with those students, I absolutely 100% had to have solid relationships with those kids if I was going to reach them in the classroom. That was first and foremost. And it doesn't matter what school you're teaching at. It doesn't matter if it's an affluent population, if it's a, a, a school with a very high minority population, if they're ESL students, if it's a very poverty-stricken school. You have got to take the time to form relationships with those students. And it goes beyond just the students. It also is about forming relationships with the school as a whole, with teachers and other um, support personnel at the school, and also knowing your community. So when we think about the relationships piece, when we think about knowing your community and school, how many of you are born and bred from New Hanover County? Okay, a few of you, you've come home to teach. All right, how many of you are um, from just North Carolina? How many of you are out of state? Me too. Okay, all right. So I encourage you, even if you're from here, I encourage you to take the time to learn about your school if you haven't already. Go back, learn about the demographics of your school, the population of your school, find out where your kids are going to church, um, find out what your students are doing after school, find out who they're hanging around with, what is their home life like. Have those conversations with your students and also the, the previous teachers, possibly, of your students so that you can have a really sort of holistic understanding of where your students are coming from. Relationships are key, so that's definitely the first R. In your packet on the first page, I believe. Knowing your school and community, is that what's on the first page? Yeah? There are seven questions at the top of that page, and I'd like you to take a second, you can work with your table to answer these. I'd like you to answer these seven questions to the best of your knowledge. I hear a lot of guessing going on. So just the first seven questions. Take a minute, try your best. All right, so I've been told we have prizes for the person who is closest. So I am gonna ask you to raise your hand when you volunteer to answer one of these questions. We will start with number one. What is the total population of New Hanover County? No. No. High or low? I'm not gonna tell you. <laughs> we said between like 230 and 260,000. You get a prize. This, it's not between 230, but it's the closest answer so far, and I can't do this all day. Okay, so the answer is 216,298, and that's as of 2014. This man gets a prize. Okay, go ahead and head over to Marsha. You get a prize. All right, it is, again, 200, 216,000, about 216,000. What is the racial breakdown? Give me top three. What is the racial breakdown? Oh, everybody's nervous. Yes. Okay, what's the percentage of each? Nope, I need it closer. Same race as 60, 30, and 8. 60, 30, and 8? No, I need it closer. Yes, ma'am. Mm -mm. No, nobody gets a prize on this one. Um, white, 81%. African American, 14.6%. And Hispanic, 5.5%. It's funny because 
if we have each of these R's that I'm giving you could be like a whole workshop into itself. And when I've had these conversations before with teachers, lots of times you go right to your student population. And I heard some of you already talking about your student population. So you're like, well, you know, if you have a large Hispanic population, well, it must be like 30% Hispanic. And you know, overall, we're talking about the whole county, which includes Wrightsville Beach, Curry Beach, Carolina Beach, and then Wilmington. And that's it, right? The Wilmington four, um, right? Um, so yeah, so you have to think about that whole area. So yeah, a little bit different, okay? The average household size. Yes, ma'am. No. <laughs> yes, ma'am. What'd you say? No. No. Yes. <laughs> you get a prize. <laughs> Two point three three. So you're third of a child. You've got 2.33. Duplin County the other day, there were like seven. Like, no, there's not seven people. No, two. <laughs> 2.33. All right, the next one the percent of people who have at least, let's start with who have at least a high school diploma. Mm, no. 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 I'll take one more. 40, no, I'll give the prize to you. It was higher. It was 90, or yeah, it was 90.6%. High school diploma, 90.6%. This gentleman, I'm giving out lots of prizes. Is that all right? <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> all right, how about a bachelor's degree? Who said that? Nah, <laughs> but I'll keep that in mind. 60, no, no. 35, you actually get the prize. It's 36%. 36, ah, oh, she stole your prize. 36%, head over to our prize ladies. All right, three more chances. What is the percentage of households that speak English only? Yes, ma'am. Oh, you get the prize. 92.4%. Yeah, English only, 92.4%. And the percentage of people living below poverty, and usually I write down what the poverty line is, but I didn't today. It's usually like 10, 12,000, and that's usually helpful if I tell you that number. 25%? No. People live, percentage of people living below poverty. How many? 60? No. 40? No. 50? No. 30? 12. I'll take 12, wherever 12 was. 12. The answer is 16, so yeah, 12, 16%, living below poverty. And that poverty line, last time I looked at it, which would have been a year ago, usually depending on the district, it's like $12,000, $13,000 for that income. Poverty line. All right, the median, and this might make sense to you since that number is somewhat low, what is the median household income? Mm. Uh, you guys are getting so close. <laughs> no, nope. I'll take I'll take what you said because you're close. Forty nine. It's forty nine thousand. It's forty nine. Forty nine. Median household income. All right. I go over these numbers with you, not to narrow down the focus of your students and those relationships to numbers but to build awareness of what these numbers are for the whole district. And then my next step, my challenge to you would be second part. Now start thinking about what are those kind of similar demographics in your own schools? What does that population, what does that racial breakdown look like in your school compared to the district? Um, start asking those kinds of questions. You know, what is the, the poverty line at your, in your school? Is your school all free and reduced lunch? Um, you know, how are your students getting to, sc to school? Are they taking the bus? Are their parents dropping them off? You know, all of those different kinds of questions help you to really understand that community and the culture of your school. Um, whenever I was at New Hanover and had an intern, was hosting an intern, I would always put them in the car on their very first day and drive them around. Show them what the neighborhoods look like. See, you know, where these students are coming from. Look at what the fast food restaurants are. See where the churches are located. Look at the after school community, the Boys and Girls Club, the you know, brigade. Go and look at these things, these opportunities that your students have or potentially the lack of opportunity that your students have. So be thinking about ways that you can get to know your students. Now, 
there's reasons why we need to form these relationships with our students. First and foremost, because a major piece of classroom management is how well you're gonna engage your students in the curriculum. And so when we think about engaging our students, first and foremost, you have to know them, right? You've gotta know what makes them tick. You need to know what motivates them. Take the time to know your students. And that could be very simple, using activities like this, getting to know you activities, and you're gonna have access to this PowerPoint on some Google document, so you don't have to write all this down. Um, but there are lots of different activities that you can do to get, get to know your students. Simple things, activities that can also be turned into instructional activities that you use with content in your classroom. You can do little things like this, and then you can also take the bigger steps, right? Start having those conversations with parents. Go talk to the social workers, talk to the guidance counselors. Don't assume that when a student walks in your classroom and is disruptive, that they're just being disruptive for the sake of being disruptive, right? Try not to take it personally. Get to the bottom of the behavior, okay? So relationships, important. Last but not least, before I go to the next R, I'd like you to take a minute and think about what is something that you are going to do, plan to do, or have done in order to form those relationships with your students? Think about that for a second and just share it out at your table. I'll give you two minutes. All right, so R number one, relationships. Second R, routines, okay? And this came out earlier as we were whipping around the room and you were sharing that one word that you associate with classroom management. Routines, procedures came up quite often. So thinking about routines, why is it important to have routines in your classroom? It's important because it helps us as teachers to be proactive and anticipate what's going to happen in any given situation. You have a routine in place for your students to get up and use the restroom. You have a routine in place when your students are absent and need to come back and collect late work or whatever the case may be. You have those kinds of things in place already. Um, routines, procedures, celebrations, consequences, uh, making it routine to access parents for parental support. These are all important things that help you be proactive in your classroom in order to anticipate outcomes and also really just at the end of the day, be better prepared in any given situation, okay? You know how to react and your students know what to expect, which is probably even more important. Um, so being proactive, as I said, helps you to anticipate outcomes. You spend decreased time and energy trying to decide what to do in any given situation. As an example, if the big, big red box in the back corner of the room suddenly started going off and the light started flashing, what would we do? Yeah, we would get out, right, because there is a fire. We would evacuate. You have been doing that since you were probably in kindergarten, first grade, right, practicing the fire drill. You want the routines and procedures in your classroom to be taught and consistently practiced just like a fire drill, okay? The more routine and procedure, the more students know what to expect in any given situation, the better managed a classroom often is. Create and explicitly teach as many routines and procedures as possible. Ask yourself. Will these routines and procedures be meaningful to your students? As a teacher, you will have your non-negotiables, okay? That's your right as a teacher. In order for you to maintain your sanity throughout the course of the day, you have one, two, three things that absolutely 100% need to happen, okay? But anytime you can engage your students in conversation with regards to those routines and procedures, the more meaningful those things will actually be to your students. I taught with a teacher at the high school who absolutely did not want her students to use pencil. She really didn't have a reason why she didn't want her students, like at first I thought maybe it was eyesight and she just really couldn't see the pencil, but no, she just didn't like pencil. And every day it was a constant battle and I know this because I was in the classroom next to her and her students would come into my room before the bell rang and say, Miss, I was Miss Dahl at that time, Miss Dahl, can I borrow a pen? I need to borrow a pen. These kids, you know, they have pens, pencils, they can't keep track of them. So it, it was constant that it was a struggle in her class. That was a routine or a procedure, a rule really, that she had that just didn't make any sense to her kids. It, it was not meaningful, okay? And she didn't have any routine or procedure in place to remedy the situation when the students didn't necessarily come prepared. Okay, so thinking about those things and whether or not they're actually meaningful to your kids. Anytime you can engage them in those conversations, the more meaningful. 
I talked earlier about this trying to control behavior. So when we, when we set up these routines and procedures, there are some things to keep in mind. Did you know that we all have a resistance principle? This, resin this resistance principle, and it's in us from a very young age, um, that instinctively tells us that when people say to do something, we automatically question it. Okay, all the neurons and the things fire in our brains, and we actually question and we think, is this the right thing to do? Can I trust this person? So when your students are coming into your classroom and you have this sort of structured classroom in place, your students are constantly trying to what? Buck the system, right? They are questioning whether or not they should be following those routines and procedures. Are those things in their best interest? Well, if they know what's best for them, it's in their best interest, right? right? But on the opposite end of the spectrum, it's equally ineffective when the teacher tries to be the best friend of the student. So we have sort of that structured environment versus, oh, this is you're a great student, you know, and I want to be your friend. So it's up to you to kind of find the happy medium in those situations. Try this. Seek first to influence your students, then to manage them. So think about those relationships first and foremost. Think about how meaningful the routines and procedures are that you have in place. Then when you form those relationships and have that connection with your students, you can start to figure out ways that will best suit them in terms of managing their behaviors. Create and teach, we already said, routines and procedures. Hold students accountable when boundaries are crossed. Repair relationships after accountability. And also, just a tip, focused on catching students being good. What to do when? On your tables, you have a little packet of cards with a clip on it. Does everybody see it? Some random color, everybody has a different color? Okay, what I would like you to do, we're gonna take just a couple minutes and think about anticipating how you would react in certain situations. So if you'll go ahead and spread those cards out face down in the middle of your table or somewhere close to somebody. Okay, you, you're in your table groups. What I'll ask you to do is each person, you'll just pick a card, read it out loud to your group, and either individually think about how you would react in that situation, or as a group table, if you want to kind of call out how you would react in that situation, either way works for me. Okay, we're going to take just about five minutes. Go through as many cards as you can. And if it doesn't apply to your table, you can move it, you can pass it. All right. For sake of time, we're not going to go to every table, but I do want to ask. I do want to ask a question. Um, were there any situations that were shared out that you had to kind of stop and go, "Wait a minute, what would I do in that particular situation?" Okay, we'll go back to Thomas. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Ours was if you don't feel supported by your administrative staff for dealing with a disruptive student, what do you do? Like if your principal won't help you at all, yeah. where do you go from there? And, and so, what did you guys come up with? Well, we talked about like using your mentor to kind of help you with that and also using other teachers. And then if that doesn't work as well, and the next step would be your administrators and they're not helping, then I guess. <laughs> going above their head. I mean, I, I don't know what the next step would be well, outside of just not dealing with it. You know I would say? say in the first place to parents, you, you have to try to engage. And I know, I, I know that is tough, trust me. Um, but trying to engage parents, trying to engage, that would be your, that would be for me my first. Before I even go up to administration or go to my mentor, I'd make sure that I have that conversation with parents or with family. Um, because most likely your administrator is going to say, have you talked to this kid's parents? And you can come back with, well, yes, I've tried and tried and tried and tried and tried, and nobody is getting back to me. Um, go to your mentor, perfect. Go to your school counselor. Go to the social worker. Again, it goes back to finding out who that kid is and you know where they're going after school. Do they play a sport? Can you connect to a coach? Um, are they really super into uh, Boy Scouts? And do you happen to know who that Boy Scout person is? You, you can't stop, you have to keep trying and keep trying, and I know it, it could be exhausting because that one student often takes up 90% of your time. <laughs> but when you're not getting the support from administration, and potentially that could happen, um, I hope it doesn't happen here for any of you, but if you are in a situation where you don't feel supported, go to those other support networks, create those other support networks. Any other advice, Marsha? I'm I calling think, you out. <laughs> I think that was perfect. And I actually, 
really love the fact that this table decided you would go to your mentor because yeah. as Andre and I work with the mentors, that is, is probably the first line of defense that I would recommend because that person can help you prepare to have the conversation with the parents or the family because that's essential. You need the buy-in from the family. You need that communication. But your mentor's there to sit with you, prepare for that meeting, prepare for that phone call, home visit, whatever it looks, however it looks. And that person could actually sit in on that conference with you if you wanted them to. The mentor's key. Any other situations where your table was just like, what do we do? Any others that came up? Okay. We had one where it was like you, you're you planning day by day, but you want to like plan out well-thought lessons, yeah. what do you do type yeah. thing. What did you um, come up with? So we were thinking just like at that point, just kind of talking with other people in your department, trying to figure out what type of activities or projects that you could do or, you know, just get through it and be like, next semester, it's going to be great because I have thought about it. <laughs> but it's kind of a tough one. So. Yeah, it is a tough one. And I would say, too, again, your mentor. Go to your mentor mm -hmm. um, because that person has been in your shoes, understands, per potentially has taught what you've taught. Mm -hmm. um, use the people who are in your department. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. Right? Mm -hmm. Find those people who are like-minded instructionally and steal all of their stuff. I hope that you all are as blessed as having that type of environment in your school and in your departments or wherever you are, grade levels, um, as, as I was, so that you can knock on somebody's door and say, hey, I'm teaching this tomorrow. What do you have? And pull in all of that information, right? Be able to pull all of that stuff. Um, you have also all of those instructional resources. I know it was a lot of information, but Kim O'Brien was talking about earlier. Um, use those kinds of resources. Don't try to reinvent, don't let Google take over your life, right? When you have a million different items, there's one million things that connected to whatever it is you Googled. Start small, use those instructional resources that are available to you. And honestly, know that there are gonna be weeks where you are planning day to day. I w I'd love to sit here and say, you know, you're gonna be planned a month out all the time. That's just not the case. I mean, that is honestly, okay? Mm -hmm. Sometimes there are gonna be those weeks where you are day to day and it will get better, right? It will get better with experience with next semester or next year, okay? I promise it will get better, mm -hmm. okay? Thank you, thank you for sharing those. So the third R is pretty simple, room. Looking at your room, looking at your room arrangement. Um, thinking about, are your desks in rows? Are your students sitting clustered together? Do you have tables? Are you in a science lab where you have all the lab materials you know, available to your kids? Um, where do, or do you have stations in your classroom? Where is the board located? Where are the students, um, what, you know, what wall do the students need to access most often? So like, where's your smart board? Where do they have to be looking at any given time? You want your room to be functional for you. You want to be able to move through your classroom, to constantly be on the move. There's a research study somewhere out there that says you should be no more than three desks away from your students at any given time. So, me to you, right? Me to you is about three desks. Um, so, me to you, you should never be, as you're rotating around the classroom, um, you should never be more than three desks away from your students. So, creating or organizing your classroom in a way that's functional. If you have a student, so thinking about misbehavior, if you have a student who is constantly misbehaving and they happen to be stuck in that back corner of your room wedged between like a wall and a closet, move that kid, okay? Or change the arrangement of your classroom. And I suggest changing it up pretty often. Keep it fresh so your students don't get used to sitting in the same place all of the time, okay? You want your classroom to be functional so that you can cruise around it and get to any student in any given situation. The fourth R is relevance and rigor. And I hate the word rigor. <laughs> I am not a fan of the word rigor. Um, the appropriate level of rigor, all right? I'm not the person who thinks that everything needs to be hard but that your, your, your instruction is relevant to your students. Um, your instruction is what we call brain compatible. If you ever have a chance in your career to go to a Marsha Tate uh, workshop, she is fantastic. On the page where you guys filled in your classroom management definition, down at the bottom, there are 20 brain compatible strategies for classroom management. 
I can't give you the whole book. Do you guys have that book on file, do you know, in your instructional tools? I'm not sure. You may, you actually may. Um, but she is absolutely fantastic, Marsha Tate. The book is called Shouting Won't Grow Dendrites, Techniques for Managing a Brain-Compatible Classroom. And what I've given you are actually the chapter titles, okay? And the chapter titles are pretty self-explanatory, okay? Where she says, be proactive, not reactive. I mean, that's pretty self-explanatory. So she talks a lot about brain-compatible teaching and the fact that our students' brains are changing due to lots of different reasons, such as nutritional deficits, lack of play, changing family structures, increased stress and anxiety at an early age. Their brains are actually changing because of all of these environmental factors. And so how do we teach based on what our students need to learn? So she talks about these 20 brain compatible strategies, um, getting your students up and moving, allowing them to talk in the classroom and have discussion, building those kinds of things into your instruction. So I think these are you know, the quickest way for me to give you 20 great tips for instruction. There you go. Um, so rigor and relevance. And again, this goes back to getting to know your students early on, right? How are you going to make your instruction relevant if you don't know them? know what motivates them, know what they're into, know how to do the nay-nay, right? <laughs> d th these things you need to, and everybody's like, what, what's the nay-nay? I see some of your faces. You have to know what they're into, and that doesn't mean you have to be a pop culture guru, but getting to know what they're into and, and potentially where they're coming from, okay? I had to learn, I remember I had one student who like lived for country music, and I do not live for country music. And in order for me to reach that kid, we had to sit down one day and have a conversation about Garth Brooks. I mean like old, not old, but old country music. We had to have a conversation about Garth Brooks, Brooks, and that was my connection to that student, okay? So taking the time to get to know those students again in order to make things relevant. Differentiation, a buzzword that comes up again and again, one size not fitting all of your kids. Okay? That doesn't necessarily mean 30 different lesson plans for 30 different kids, but knowing that you can adjust your curriculum, your teaching strategies, your classroom environment in order to meet the needs of your students. So when we think differentiating instruction in order to increase the level of rigor and also make your teaching relevant, think about how you can adjust content, think about how you can adjust process, and also product, final product. So those are the three components of differentiation, and then some research also bumps environment in there as well. But content, process, and product. So in a differentiated classroom, your student differences shape your curriculum. In order, in, instead of trying to figure out how they're all the same, right, figure out how they're different. Pre-assessment is very typical and frequent, figuring out what your students know about a given topic and then teaching from there. Multiple options for students, so student choice is valued. There's variable pacing, various grading criteria are used, lots of rubrics. Um, individual efforts and growth are honored. So every student may not have gotten an A on this particular project, but Jimmy, who you thought might have been a D, actually bumped up to a C. Awesome. Okay, that's growth. And growth really is what we're going for with each of our kids. So differentiation being a, peak, a key piece to that uh, rigor and relevance. And I'm going to skip this just because we're running out of time. But in your packets, you have a tic-tac-toe activity. So just as an example of differentiation. So just an example of a differentiated activity where I would ask you to choose three activities in order to kind of brainstorm what is differentiation. You would choose a cross, down, or diagonal. And then I'd ask you to do each of the activities. Now, if I was a really amazing teacher, um, then my tic-toe act activity would also be according to Bloom's taxonomy. So the activity in the top left corner would be a knowledge activity. Then the next one would be comprehension. The next one would be application. So if my students chose a cross or down or diagonal, each activity would challenge them a little bit more. Does that make sense? Okay, so the activities that I design are along Bloom's taxonomy, so my students are challenged as they go. Okay, so just as an example of differentiation. And those are a bunch of examples of differentiation. Last but not least, my last R is reinforcements. Okay, and when I say reinforcements here, I do not necessarily mean reinforcing your students, rewarding your students, although it's a wonderful tradition or wonderful practice. What I mean by reinforcements is finding somebody to support you, <laughs> OK? 
okay? Because you can't do it by yourself. If you're a first year teacher, some of you not a first year teacher, but in a new county first year, there is so much to learn. There is so much growth that is going to happen for you as a teacher in these first few years that you want to find the people who are going to reinforce you, okay? Your mentor being definitely that first line of support. Dealing with chronic behavior problems that are not alleviated by conventional classroom management strategies, you've tried the relationships, you've looked at the routines, you've examined the relevance, um, you've identified that your room can't change anymore. You went through the first four R's, okay? Now it's time to seek help. Seek help from parents, seek help from coaches, seek help from guidance counselors, from social workers, from um, that, that student's EC teacher, whatever the case may be, all right? Find help to support you. Some things to think about. Early intervention is important. Don't let the behavior snowball, snowball, snowball. Try to get to it early. Celebrate minimal progress or success. I gave the example earlier, moving from the D to the C. Awesome, celebrate that, it's growth. Adapting your instruction to meet the needs of your students. Visual, multi-sensory, short-term activities. A friend of mine post, posted on Facebook the other day that one of her goals for this year, she's a teacher, one of the goals for this year is she wants to make sure she's doing at least four or five activities in each 90-minute block. That's her goal, four or five activities every day. So short activities based on the attention span of your students, which really is only, depending on their age level, about 10 or 15 minutes, okay? Um, make your classroom predictable, so that structured classroom, we talked about the routines and the procedures, teaching those, being consistent, making them meaningful to your students. And then as I just said, stay calm, seek help. Okay, seek out the people who are going to support you. That's the true R here with reinforcements. And as I said earlier, remember, those chronic misbehaviors in your classroom are five to 10% of your students. They'll probably take up 90% of your time. So make sure that you come in each day and you start that day with a clean slate. Okay, best piece of advice that I can give you. So you've got five R's here that we went over, and I asked you at first to think about one thing that you struggle with in terms of classroom management. And so as you're wrapping up, or as we're wrapping up today, think about, would any of those R's have helped you in that particular situation? Was it a relationship issue? Did you need to look at where that student was placed in your room? Was it a room arrangement issue? And so on and so forth. Um, what could you control in this situation? What is out of your control? And then what is your next step? So four questions to consider when you're faced with any classroom management challenge. And you will have access to this PowerPoint. It will be in a BT toolbox that you will learn more about. Um, so you can always come back to this to say, what was that R again that that crazy lady was talking to me about in the middle of day two on my three-day BT orientation? Um, you can always come back to this. Any questions? Any questions? I know you're receiving a lot of information. I hope this was somewhat helpful and hopefully got you excited thinking about your kids and what you're gonna do in order to better manage and engage your students this semester. Um, as I said, when I first came in, I oversee our beginning teacher support program at UNCW. I couldn't come here without giving a plug to our program. Um, we do offer support to all beginning teachers in the Southeast, Re Southeast region of the state. So as I said, even if you're not a UNCW graduate, we welcome you with open arms. We provide three days of professional development um, on campus at UNCW. You'll get information about that if your principals have some funding set aside where they're able to support you to go. We also have a program where we represent, so this would be next year and the year after, promising beginning teachers who are showing great leadership. So I know Marsha and Robin are always on the lookout for great, and Andrea now, are always on the lookout um, for great promising beginning teachers who are doing excellent things in their classrooms. Um, those teachers are actually invited back in their second and their third year um, free of charge. And then we support you and provide you with some extra support with regards to your growth. So we've got resources available online, lots of great things. Just know that we're here to support you. I know earlier I'll just add, um, when Kim was talking about instructional resources, we do have our Center for um, C-STEM, our Center for the Education STEM, I'm not science, STEM, I'm not math, I'm not any of those things, I'm English. Um, so STEM, we have that. I know they have their loan program where they also have science kits and tools and things like that. Many of you may know about it just from going through the programs our Assistive Technology Center, our Marine Science Center, know that you have these resources available to you. And when you're ready to start exploring them, um, you have people like me who you can connect with 
and I can send you in the right direction. Okay? So thanks for having me. Always a pleasure, Summer. Thank you so much. I get out of your way.